Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. So my long-winded uh, title is up there, and I'll explain it uh, in a little bit. Um, before we do anything, I just want to uh, give a quick shout out to Mark. I'm not sure if he made it this morning, but Mark uh, essentially set a goal for making prettier slides than me. And I'm not sure how many of you caught his slides yesterday, but they were ridiculously awesome. Um, so wherever you were, uh, that was amazing, and it's cheating because you've got a team of designers, apparently. <laughs> but it was tech um, So um, super quickly, um, I want to say thanks to Brucon for having me. Um, Brucon actually invited me for my first keynote back in 2011, um, for which I want to say uh, thanks. And then they also lost the recording, so I want to say thanks twice. Um, because that worked out pretty well, all things considering. Um, and then um, thanks to all of you for coming uh, so early in the morning. Um, I want to add some disclaimers really quickly because um, these sorts of talks are pretty hand wavy. And, and almost, almost everything that I'm going to say today is based on what I feel. So it's not backed up by hard science. Even um, those of you who have read into imposter syndrome and Dunning-Kruger effect probably get slight twitches because it, it's pretty close to junk science, um, but I'll go with it anyway. Um, the other thing is that a fair amount of this talk, or, or at least pieces of it, are recycled from some of my other talks. And the reason for that is mainly because I haven't changed my opinion on some things. Like if I thought enough about something, and felt it was important enough to speak about, I probably still think it's important enough to speak about and it comes up again. Um, so for this talk, uh, mainly I'm going to crib from three other talks that I've given. Um, one called Fig Leaf Security, where the whole crux was we hide behind a whole bunch of fig leaves in, uh, in InfoSec. Um, the one that I gave here, which was you and your research, which was largely cribbed from Richard Hemming's talk. You should be seeing a theme right now. Um, and, and the last one was a talk I gave at T2 called Learning the Wrong Lessons from Offense. Um, for years and years, we've been telling people defense should learn from offense. And I think part of the reason we're getting it wrong is because we're learning the long, wrong lessons. Like, I think there are valuable lessons, but I think we take away the wrong ones. Um, and uh, the one other thing is just that most of this is based on me. So if you feel slightly insulted, uh, don't be. Chances are it's, it's stuff that applied to me and certainly affected uh, how I got here. In, in fact, most of this talk could just be looked at as uh, old men yelling at things. Um, if, if we look at the talk uh, title for the most part, um, what you should notice straight off is that it falls in that TED style, junk science, something interesting you can talk about at a dinner party but doesn't actually hold up. Um, so you could go with an alternate title, which is basically, don't be that guy, okay? So for most of this talk, what I'm going for is, here's some stuff, don't be that guy. Um, so the three things that we want to go into here, um, market for lemons, imposter syndrome, and the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, lemon markets, people have been speaking about for, for a while now. It goes back to a 1970 um, economics paper um, by George Akerlof. Um, everyone here heard of it? Um, essentially, it describes a type of market failure um, that happens when there's information asymmetry in the market. Okay, and the, the way the theory works is you have this market where you could buy cars and the car is either a good car or it's a lemon. Um, the problem you have is that the customer or the buyer can't tell the difference. So over a, a while, the customer expects to pay the price for lemons because that's the only, or when he gets it, that's what he remembers. And over time, people with good cars pull them off the market because why would you sell your good car if the only thing you get is the price for a lemon? And eventually, the only thing left in the market are lemons. And my main argument here is that this information asymmetry exists heavily for us in InfoSec. For those of you who are doing research, for those of you who are aiming at research grade problems, it's certainly one of the areas you'd want to be aiming at, which is how can consumers tell the difference? 
between good products and lemons. Um, there's a few people, a few very smart people aiming at it. Um, Sarah Zatko um, started ITIL with Mudge, and they're looking at it. But, but there's a lot of questions to be answered here. Um, how we can tell a product is actually secure um, is, is a tricky one. Um, you'll know guys from P0, guys like Taviso, have been banging hard against AV products for a while, for example. And they've come up with the, or lots of people have come up with the theory that says, actually, some of those security products add so much of extra code to your existing code base that actually it, you are less secure running those products than you were before that. Um, much, much longer ago, FX from Finlet said that security software was so badly written, you are probably better off trying to protect your network with Microsoft Word. Um, it's, it's funny. But in a way, it's funny because it's true. In Vericode's first report, when they did the assessment, security software came second only to CMS software in terms of how insecure it was. OK? And the main thing is people can't tell the difference. You land at an airport, you see that XYZ product is going to be using next-gen machine learning to protect your network. And they tell it to you enough, eventually you start to think it's true. Um, the next one that I want to touch on, and this is almost my whole reason for doing the talk today, um, was this one on imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is kind of interesting because it's really, really well discussed, especially in InfoSec. Um, so imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern where individuals doubt their accomplishments. Okay, you persistently feel that you're going to be uncovered as a fraud. And if you look at Twitter, um, for today's talk, this morning I removed a whole bunch of tweets that I previously had used as evidence, mainly because I think it's uh, calling out people is not necessary. Um, but you would know lots of people discuss, I'm on stage, I'm about to talk, imposter syndrome kicking in. I want to do X, imposter syndrome kicking in. And for the most part, um, I think that this is slightly misguided. Um, and, and the reason why I think it's, it's slightly misguided is I think there's a huge difference between uh, genuine imposter syndrome, which is Einstein being Einstein and thinking that actually he's about to be discovered as a fraud, and someone who's been in InfoSec for a year and a half looking at Halva Flake and saying, I have imposter syndrome. Um, if you're standing next to Halva, it's not imposter syndrome. He has more brains than a small country. Um, he probably is smarter than you. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that if you want to level up, you've got to work incredibly hard, um, like they have. And, and I think, as small as it is, I think there's something we miss when we explain it away to imposter syndrome. Because I think what we should be saying is, holy smoke, I really want to be that guy or that girl and working like crazy for it. And, and the example that I give here um, is Doug Song. So um, I met Doug a few times, but almost every time I do, I waste the first few minutes just going, oh my god, it's Doug Song. Um, because the teenager in me um, remembers when I thought Doug was just a, a superhero legend. And what's interesting is, he kind of is. Way back in 2001, um, I released one of my first tools, which is a way to scan hosts on the network, and it was ghetto and written in Perl. And that same time, Doug released the C library for crafting packets. He, he wrote libdnet. And after that, in my career, I went and I studied to become a checkpoint engineer, for those of you who remember the CCSE. And while I was doing my CCSE, Doug, Thomas Lopatic, and Horizon did a talk at Black Hat on breaking Firewall 1. And they took it to pieces. Um, and now I've got a company, and we sell a product, and people like us for the most part. And Doug's got a company, and he sold it for some squillion dollars. When I stand next to Doug, it's not imposter syndrome. Doug's achieved a whole lot more than me. And for me to think that that's just a psychological thing, that's just me thinking um, that, that I haven't achieved as much as him, kind of takes away from what Doug's put out. And it stops me from, from working as hard as he does. And, and 
the main reason I say this, um, for those of you who haven't seen the 2011 talk, you and your research, it's worth going back and checking, mainly because the thoughts are mainly not mine. Um, they belong to Richard Hamming, making them better thoughts in general. Um, but what you'll notice, um, with a show of hands, how many of you have seen that talk or read Richard Hamming's You and Your Research paper? Okay, that's shockingly few of you, not for my talk, but you should go read that paper. Um, so if there's one thing you take away from this, go read Richard Hamming's You and Your Research. There'll be a link uh, shortly. Um, Hamming gives advice to people on how to do uh, great quality work. And what's interesting is he starts off by explaining how he did his study of other great scientists. Essentially, he says, look, he came to work on the Manhattan Project, and when he arrived, he was there to fix the computers, and he saw that he was just a stooge. Okay, he stood next to Feynman and Oppenheimer and Fermi and Hans Beth, and he saw that these guys were walking legends, and he was there to fix their computers. And what's important is that he didn't stand back and go, oh, woe is me, I have imposter syndrome. He went back and said, what makes Feynman Feynman, and how can I get some of that? Okay, and for those of you who've studied mathematics, you probably come across Hamming distance, uh, Hamming's uh, differential equations. He, he went on to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, he, he's got a pretty great history. So, um, like I said, um, old man shouting at cloud, um, lots of the stuff is gonna be super personal. Um, try not to let it sting. Um, but one of my main reasons for doing it is because I think um, we in danger as individuals and as a, as a discipline. And mainly, I think, our danger comes from um, the flip side of imposter syndrome, which is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay, the Dunning-Kruger effect is great because it allows you to scream at people on internet chats anytime someone disagrees with you. Anytime someone disagrees with you, you basically get to say, the only reason you're disagreeing with me is because you're too stupid to know that I'm smarter than you. Um, but that was not the original intention of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, the, the effect talks about the cognitive bias that those people who don't know enough to know that they don't know enough ass assume that their skills are much higher than they are. Um, I think this applies to us in a very deep way in InfoSec. And there's a few simple pointers to this, right? The, the industry has more people than ever. There's more money than ever in the industry. Like, like, people are paid ridiculous amounts of money. And more hacks are happening than ever before. Okay, something doesn't add up there. Clearly something's wrong. And so my hypothesis is, um, for the most part, we're currently sucking. Um, and that we are sucking because we look around and think everyone else is sucking, but we are okay. Okay, and, and you see this in, in a whole bunch of places. I've spoken at conferences next to people who've given talks on how to protect your network just days before their network was taken to the cleaners in the most public way possible. Okay, literally that person stood up and spoke and told people how to secure their networks while their network was being pillaged and they had no idea that it was happening. Okay, and, and that's uh, surprisingly common. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the technical challenges we face. Um, I've, I've done other talks on this, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip them. Um, for the most part, what I'm gonna talk about here are what Hamming calls our personality defects, um, the things that may be holding us back. So I showed my kid's sister this talk, and she said, way to uh, win friends. Um, so yeah, for, for the most part, this, this is my attempt to, to lose all the friends I have. Um, the, probably the best advice for this, um, Jason Fried from 37 Signals has a really interesting, really short piece um, titled, Give It Five Minutes. Um, and essentially what he talks about is this one instance where he was attending a talk Somebody got up, spoke about something. He met the guy after the talk and he started going at the guy's points. And the guy told him, hey dude, like, give it five minutes. And he says it changed his life. He says because what he realized is the speaker had been thinking about it for a while 
he's been thinking about it for 20 seconds, and already he's just full of stuff to hit back on. And for the most part, actually what he needs to do is just let it settle for a little bit. Like, like think about it, it, it doesn't mean that everyone speaking is infallible. For the most part, give it five minutes, um, uh, let it settle. Five minutes is also the amount of time I calculated I need to get out of here. Um, so, so it's not chosen at random. Um, so, so we want to start with this. Um, Joanna Geary, um, who's currently the head of curation um, at Twitter, um, tweeted recently, and, and this was super, super interesting. So, so she was working at The Guardian, and The Guardian has all of these comments. Um, if you've ever read them, we all read them, even though the internet law is that we shouldn't. Um, they were interested in knowing how many people had genuine expertise on a topic. So first-hand experience or some sort of degree. Um, and so they ended up putting together um, some sort of online survey. Um, where they watch the comments and then the survey tries to get the person's uh, qualifications. Um, interestingly, the result that they got back was almost everyone believed they were experts on three to five major topic areas. Um, now she's humble and she says maybe their survey could have been better. But what's interesting here is that almost all of them believed that they were experts because they followed the news. Okay, and um, we kick this around a little bit on Twitter, and I think there's an interesting correlation here to this and InfoSec, okay, where we've been deluged with InfoSec news for a really long time. And it's gotten to the point where people are always questioning, how do I keep up with the news? How do I keep up with the news? And to some extent, people believe that keeping up with the news gives them some measure of expertise. And sometimes, or for a lot of the time, that's just the same thing repeating over and over at different organizations. Keeping up with the news doesn't make you any smarter, doesn't tell you how to stop the stuff. Um, it just keeps you busy. Um, interestingly, after I tweeted this, a whole bunch of people DM'd me to tell me, surely you don't think a degree is the most important way of judging expertise. Um, yes, totally not what I was saying. Um, so following the news doesn't make you an expert, um, but there are important lessons that can probably be gleaned from it. Um, <sighs> so, quick question. How many of you recognize the guy there? Okay, so almost everyone does. Um, he's pretty crazy pants, so, so yeah. Um, for those of you who don't, that's John McAfee. Um, <laughs> that video was, was like when he started to come back just before he went on a bender running from the police in Belize. Um, but recently there was a whole bunch of drama because John McAfee backed this Bitfi uh, hardware wallet which apparently was unhackable um, and the internet went crazy. How many of you here followed the John McAfee Bitfee story. Quick show of hands. How many of you here feel confident explaining to me what Bitfee did wrong in terms of keeping their secret in memory? Okay, looks like it's about a fraction of a percent. Okay, and, and for the most part, this is my point. The lesson there was not McAfee backed someone, McAfee is going to McAfee. It's literally how he makes his money now. It wasn't that Bitfee made claims that were not true. They're trying to sell people stuff. They're going to make claims on anything. The takeaway for us in InfoSec should have been, what should they have done? It was a problem with, ze one of their problems was with zeroing memory, which they weren't doing. How do we fight that? It was a cold boot attack. How does that actually work in principle? There were a whole bunch of things to learn there. But instead, for the most part, we get caught up in the drama. And there were some genuine researchers, um, Cyber Gibbons. There were guys who, who jumped on this, uh, took the thing to pieces, examined what they could. But there were probably about 10 to 15 of them. And there were hundreds and hundreds of InfoSec people just tearing into this thing on the internet. And for the most part, the other people weren't adding anything to the story. And if we were climbing into it, we weren't adding anything to the story. We were just 
keeping ourselves occupied um, with infosecciness. Um, and it gets slightly worse. Does anyone here remember the T-Mobile drama? Okay, so a few people. T-Mobile, someone picked up that they were using plain text passwords. Um, she pointed it out to them, saying, hey, probably not a good idea. Um, the T-Mobile rep came back and said, don't worry, we got this. Um, the person very politely said, hey, maybe you want to show this to your devs. T-Mobile doubled down on, on their response. I really don't get why this is a problem. You have so many passwords for every app, blah, blah, blah. And the next step, the internet went nuts again. Okay, so InfoSec people from everywhere jumped on this person, dived on them. T-Mobile are idiots. People started scanning T-Mobile ranges. People started posting misconfigured T-Mobile boxes in different parts of the world. Do you think this lady, uh, I think it turned out to be a lady, who is social media no person number 32 at T-Mobile, knows or cares about misconfigured T-Mobile servers in Eastern Europe. Okay, and it's so far outside of her bailiwick. It's got nothing to do with her. And, and more importantly, for us as uh, security researchers or professional, professionals, there's literally nothing to be gained from this engagement. Like, there were people pouncing on her literally for days. And in part, it becomes a thing where you kind of signal to the rest of the crowd that I also know this stuff, and I'm also smart, and I also wouldn't make this mistake. Look at that idiot person from T-Mobile. And again, it's just a distraction. It's just a waste of time, and it doesn't really help anything. Um, in the end, this person was like, ha-ha, you're saying this, and there's XSS on your website. What does that lady know about XSS? What's she going to do with that? Okay, and, and the stuff actually happens any time there's a breach. Any time there's a big breach, a whole bunch of people line up to say, why didn't they just do XXX? Whatever XXX is. So they had weak passwords, they had a box they didn't know about, they had an S3 bucket that was open. Oh, how stupid, why didn't they do XXX? And for that, the, the easy way to discuss it is for us to go all the way back to War and Peace. Um, because what you should know is way back in 1862, when Tolstoy wrote this, um, he was talking about how easy it was to armchair quarterback battles. And he says, you look at a battle and you see, well, here was one army and here was the other army. He should have done X, Y, Z. And he points out that the commander never has that view of battle. The commander's view of the battle is always fluid. Things are always changing. And it doesn't look the same as it does to you when you looked at it, uh, w when you read about it. And for the most part, I'm saying that discussions post-breach are really, really easy. Because the whole job when you are CISO is choosing. The choosing is the hard part. If we had unlimited time and unlimited budget, sure, we'll do everything. The thing that's difficult is finding out which are the things that they need to focus on. Um, and in terms of choosing, I, I want to be clear. I have the firm belief that lots and lots of companies are choosing incorrectly, but that's a different problem. Like, I don't think people should be getting away with stuff. Um, my very next slide is, is forget the get out of jail free cards. But what's important for us is that we go away from seeing breaches Asking the question, how would this have applied to us? How would we have handled this differently? And, and I'll tell you two reasons why we should be doing this. One is just because it's the more empathetic thing to do. But the other is because I genuinely believe that there's huge millions of dollars waiting to be taken in by people who see these as problems that are want, needing to be solved and actually solve them. Um, the example that I give up here is kind of obscure. I once consulted for a company, suggested to them they run Emmet. They had a super smart reverse engineer working for them who told me how he could bypass Emmet.
And so they never, they never did the Emmet rollout. Okay, it's true that guy was wicked smart and could bypass Emmet. It was still the best thing that, that they needed to do. For the size of org that they had, for the number of XP machines that they actually had, they actually needed uh, enhanced protection and they should have done it. Um, again, I'm not saying um, it's a get out of jail free card. In fact, I'm saying learning from breaches is critical. Um, out of interest, show of hands, how many of you here have a phishing problem at your company? Like you think your company could get fished? And that's super interesting. So one of the things that's interesting is many, many years ago, we built a phishing simulation thing to teach companies how to respond to phishing attacks. We built it, we sold it, we sold it to a whole bunch of customers. And it's only last year that phishing became real for us as a company. That's because last year we grew in size and now we have a lady who full time just handles our accounts. And so for the first time, mails from DHL or FedEx that say, here's your documents in document.zip, please look at it, is not going to someone with a security background. And I can tell you it sucks. I can't guarantee that she's not going to open one of these. And it's a stupid problem. Like, like this is an easy problem for us to kill. Someone should be working on killing this. Um, but as five men start up with a whole bunch of security engineers, it's not the problem that we aimed at. And I suspect um, it's why lots of these problems uh, get away. Um, again, with a show of hands, how many of you here are blue team versus red team? So blue team, nice. Um, more than I expected, go blue. Um, so blue teaming um, can be hard. Um, but I think it's hard for different reasons to what most people expect. Um, so recently someone tweeted this, where they go, I just want to know, why does security constantly have to justify its presence? Like legal doesn't have to justify their presence, marketing doesn't have to justify their presence. And uh, I've, given an, I've given entire rants on this. Like I think this is wrong-minded. I think we do have to justify our presence. I think everyone else has to justify their presence too. If marketing does a sucky job and just says, you guys should all come to me, very shortly people will root around them and start using external, external marketing people. If legal hold everything back, people will just stop passing through legal. And that's what happens um, to security. Um, there's really good talks on this. Um, if you get a chance, you should check out Rich Smith's talk at Etsy on building a security organization that works. But, but the crux of it is we're starting to see examples of security teams who engage with the company, who build things for the company, and effectively have these companies uh, loving them and using them. Um, so in terms of the challenges I want to touch on really quickly, I mentioned the talk uh, learning the wrong lessons from offense. And I think that offense has some benefits that defense lacks, but not because offense was born cleverer. In fact, most of these things are not because offense is particularly gifted, it's just that the dynamic ends up giving offense a few advantages. And probably the biggest one for me is this one. Offense has really tight feedback loops. So for about 10 years, um, we ran a pen testing company and if you take pen testing as offense, it's really simple. Either your guy breaks in or he doesn't break in. At the end of the engagement, you know whether he added value or not. On the defending side, you can work for years and never be tested like that. You can work for years and never know if you were adding value or just moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. And for the most part, that's something you need to be constantly aware of. You need to be checking up on whether your stuff is actually making a difference and making a difference for real. Um, what this leads to is the fact that attackers know the cost of things. I can tell you with relatively good ballparking, it's going to take me about a month to break this. Um, defenders lack this information. Um, Dino Daisovi has given an entire talk called Attacker Maths 
on how you can uh, try to model these attacks to try to figure out um, which is the least cost for an attacker to take. Um, the problem with attacker mats is unless you understand attacks, you don't know what those numbers look like. Um, and it's something we're going to have to figure out how we overcome. Um, very recently, this whole discussion came up on Twitter, which is, sh should we have to write code as, uh, as attackers or as defenders? And, and a bunch of people chimed in with, uh, I've been working in this industry for so many years and I don't write code, I guess I should go home, blah, blah, blah. And I can see why you take it personally, but I think it's wrong-minded. Attackers win because, by and large, attackers do write code. Um, we'll go into this discussion in a little bit, but I think it's important. I think coding is a superpower, uh, or at least scripting is, and if you're not doing it, it's something you should go back. It's a hole you should go back and fix um, if you want to do InfoSec. Um, whenever you talk to a blue teamer, you'll see they come back and talk about all the enterprise obstacles they have. This is the problem, that's the problem, um, management's a problem. Um, and what's super interesting is that I think our attitude to these obstacles is possibly the biggest obstacle that we have. Now, this sounds all Zen and Stoic because in part it comes from a book called The Obstacle is the Way. Um, but what's interesting is if you ever worked red teaming something or if you worked trying to hacksaw something, you go into the problem expecting things to not work. You go in expecting stuff to be broken. And then you chip away at the brokenness till you have a solution. Um, if you're pen testing, little things will not work. You get a reverse shell, but it doesn't echo your characters. And you go, yes, that's what's going to happen because we don't have a proper terminal. You put up with a whole bunch of brokenness because you know it's not supposed to work. You hack at it and you make it work. In defense, there's a common attitude that says, we tried this, it didn't work, forget that, let's move on to the next one. We tried this, it false positive, let's move on. That's just not how it works. Okay, yes, it's gonna false positive because that's what it does. Figure it out, hack around it, see if you can make it work. Um, in terms of of the Dunning-Kruger stuff specifically, one of the attitudes or one of the thoughts that come up often on Twitter is this one that says that it's always easier for someone else. Um, and I can talk about this for ages because it's, it's a personal uh, hobby horse of mine. But you'll find this bump up again and again. Recently, I screamed to the guys who write Burp Suite and I said, hey, well done, you guys managed to build this without taking VC funding, that's amazing. And immediately, a whole bunch of people replied with, they were only able to do it because they worked for a consulting company. They were only able to do it because they were not in Silicon Valley. They were only able to do it because reason X, Y, Z. A, that's unnecessary, but B, that's just wrong. It's always hard. Ask anyone who works at a consulting company and they'll tell you how many times they tried to launch a product and it never launched. It's always hard. It just always seems easier for someone else because you don't see all of the work that goes into it. Um, it's, it's a painful attitude and it's one that actually hurts us more than anyone else. And for all of these things, um, we need to be really honest with ourselves about the amount of work, uh, real work, that we're actually putting into it. So again, while I'm on the junk science junket, um, all of you should have heard by now about the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours thing, okay, which is you put in 10,000 hours into something to become an expert. 10,000 hours translates to what in real time? Five years? Um, depending on how you look at it, a crazy 400 days um, of determined time. But we know tons of people who've been in InfoSec for more than five years, right? You know people who've been in it for 10 and 15 years and longer. And does that mean that they are walking around as experts? Well, in my BrewCon talk the last time, I spoke about Dino, and Dino said, if you found a bug, chances are someone else has found it 
and chances are that person is Tavisa. Okay, and um, it was really good because when I gave that talk, um, there was actually this example. Um, I was talking about how Tavisa spent all of his free time working on this crack me. This crack me is no longer at that URL, but you can Google it. And if you Google it, you see that Tavisa spent months on this thing. Um, all of you know what crack me's are. They toy programs that people write challenges. You go try to crack it. And if you read his solution, you'll read, tried to crack it months later, did this months later, and then eventually he talks about how he got it. And while we were doing this talk, or while I was at Brucon this year, you have this guy, um, and this dude's actually watching How I Met Your Mother um, in the talk. And the whole point was, both of these people are going to say they've been doing InfoSec for N years. Um, one of them is going to end up being Tavisa. Um, the other one's going to know eventually how he met uh, someone's mother. Okay, and <laughs> what you'll notice from this stuff is it's remarkably consistent. Um, in the example that I gave back then, you look at GeoHot, um, who first jailbroke the iPhone, or at least uh, unlock the iPhone, and he's stupidly young to be doing that stuff. But you'll see that at the time, it was not the first thing he was doing. He dedicated years of his life to getting that skill. Um, and for the most part, we look at those guys and think it's easy because his father was an engineer or something. Um, but for the most part, they're just putting crazy amounts of time into it. Um, last week, um, Filippo Valsoda was on uh, Gary McGraw's Silver Bullet podcast, and again, it's ridiculous how young Filippo is. Um, it's, he's crazy young. And he now uh, manages all of the crypto for Google for their Go packages. Um, when you see all the coolness coming out with Go Google releasing Tink and all of that, largely it's Filippo's work. And before that, Filippo was at Cloudflare. And if you recognize the name before that, he wrote the heart bleed check that the whole world was hitting. Um, and on the podcast, Gary asks Filippo how he got into this. Filippo doesn't have a degree, for example. He just started doing the stuff. And he answered the Matasano crypto challenges. Um, how many of you here know about the Matasano crypto challenges? How many of you completed past level four? Hmm, nice. So there's about three people. Um, so, what's into, uh, so, so firstly, what the crypto challenges are is Tom Tachek and other guys at Matasano put together a whole bunch of exercises that you can go attempt and essentially learn applied cryptography. Um, and what you'll notice from the FAQ, how much crypto do I need to know? None. That is the point. Okay, so by walking through these challenges, in the end, you end up literally breaking open SSL, um, doing Tai Dong's beast attacks. Um, you end up doing ridiculously advanced crypto. All of us could have done it. None of us do. Filippo did, and that's why Filippo is Filippo. And, and again, what's important is that we give Filippo credit for doing it, and that we know that that's what it takes to level up, because um, that's what it takes. Um, so I spoke about the importance of, of writing code. Um, Alex Stamos gave a talk a little while back where he talked about the Fortune 500. He said there's the secure 100 that know how to defend, and the toasted 400 who are broken and don't know that they're broken. Um, and interestingly, what he stated the difference was between them was the ability to create their own tooling, okay? If you on the blue team, if you're doing defense, you absolutely should be, this is a hill I'm totally prepared to die on. You totally should be writing code. Um, spend the time, it's worth it. Um, and it makes complete sense. Um, software is eating the world. Everything uh, becomes a software company. You need to be learning how to do it. Um, it's super easy if you're doing InfoSec um, to end up being nihilistic. In, in fact, recently, um, Tech Republic, as part of like CISO magazine, put out this article, 10 signs that you aren't cut out to be a security specialist. And number 10 was, you can't accept that there are no winners because the whole point was that you've got to figure out that the game can't be won, it can only be played. 
and I think that's absolute nonsense. Like, like we've carried on that thinking for so ridiculously long that people start to accept it like it's true. You need to figure out for your org what winning is. And winning might not be patching all your servers 100%. It might not be not getting fished. You need to figure out what winning is for your org and make that stuff happen. And for the most part, um, something that I said um, when I, uh, in a talk a little while back is if you're working at an org as a CISO and you say, but the board doesn't get it, but the org doesn't get it, at some point the argument is, well, either you fix it or get out of there. Let someone else come try to fix it. And maybe you should go somewhere where they do listen to you. But, but staying in the same place and complaining that the org doesn't get it allows you to wallow in this sense of, well, I'll just go day to day, and if nothing really happens, uh, it's probably OK. And if we're talking about CISOs, um, something that we need to remember is that almost all genetic advice is wrong, um, including this one. Like I said, maybe phishing doesn't matter for you. Maybe patching doesn't matter for you. And part of the problem with taking in all of this news is you keep hearing things that you have to be doing. And maybe you don't. Maybe that's not right. Um, researchers laugh at people who, who think that using Signal and using Tor is the answer to everything. But if you're following the news, um, right now there's a huge cadre of people who think that using Chromebooks and using Beyond Corp will solve all their problems. Okay, and Beyond Corp is, is cool. Um, show of hands, who hasn't heard of Beyond Corp? So, so I gave a talk a little while back where I asked people who hadn't. And interestingly, or, or who had, there was only one person in the audience who had heard of it, and he was from Google. Um, it's, it's pretty well understood now. Um, Google put out this document, which is a throwback to uh, its zero trust networking. And, and if you remember a few years back, uh, Microsoft and a whole group uh, put together an organization trying to do the same thing. But Google have really advanced it and Google are there. So it doesn't matter if you're on the Mountain View campus or if you're in a coffee shop in Kuala Lumpur, to the Google network, you are, it treats you the same. It needs something else. It's got its root of trust elsewhere to decide whether it trusts you or not. Now, I'm not knocking Beyond Trust or Beyond Corp and I'm not knocking Chromebooks. Both are amazing. But I don't think the lesson for us was that we needed to go to zero trust networking or that we needed to go to Chromebooks. The real lesson is what Google did when Google figured out that they were getting hacked and couldn't stop it. So, so Google went on this drive after the Aurora incident when some of their massive brains looked at stuff and said, oh my god, how do we stop this? And then they figured out all the way down, right down to your machines. You couldn't trust. You didn't know what you didn't know. And there's certainly stuff in Beyond Corp that we can emulate. There's certainly benefits from Chromebooks that we can steal. But the most important lesson is that you need to look at what the specific threats for your org are and then engineer a way around it. Um, the original uh, Beyond Trust paper was super awesome in that one of your first reactions to seeing Google pull this off is to go, well, they Google. Of course they could. They're a new company. Google's not a young company anymore. They had fat legacy systems on their network also. And they document how they had to phase it out. Like, there were systems nobody knew who admined it anymore. And so they sniffed next to it for a while to see who connected to it. And then they moved those people off. It's the same engineering challenges we have on our networks. They just uh, went for it and did it. Um, when you are CISO, something you often hear is people saying, well, we do a risk-based approach so this stuff doesn't affect us. And again, it's, it's worth dialing in to, to understand what they mean when they say that. I've, I've met organizations with really pretty Excel spreadsheets that show you with green, orange, red indicators how dangerous or how safe their network was. And it's baffling to me because I've got no idea where they're pulling those stats from. And I don't mean I don't know where they're pulling their stats from because I asked them. I just don't understand why they think that's a representative of their threats. 
There's a whole bunch of threats that they're completely unaware of, but they're blissfully happy because the indicators are all showing green. And again, it's one of those times where we should be using every one of the public breaches to ask ourselves honestly, how would we have stopped this? Would we even have caught this? So you hear Ticketmaster getting owned because Ticketmaster pulled in JavaScript that was coming from someone, and someone owned that person. So somewhere in this supply line, they injected bad JS, which now sniffed credit cards on their website. And everyone goes, oh no, how stupid is Ticketmaster? Who at your org is actually checking your node dependencies? Like, like you write simple node code right now, and you're pulling in tons of libraries. We have, a, we have a coding exam that we give to people uh, who want to work for us. And, and one of them is a really simple, draw this graph in JS for this data. And we've seen people write solutions up to six megs big, because the first thing they do is just pull in libraries from everywhere. Who's managing this at your organization? The recent Facebook breach, ultimately what caused it? Anyone confident enough? Show of hands? Anyone? Like that stuff's big news. If you're on Twitter, you probably retweeted it. You probably laughed to someone, haha, Facebook got owned. The lesson for it is what made them get owned and how can we make sure we're not getting owned the same way? Um, if you're a CISO, the question of how you're testing your assumptions has to come through. Um, I do this just because I really like the speech. Um, if, if you guys haven't watched Ratatouille, you totally should. Um, uh, in the speech, in, in the movie, Anton Ego gives the speech, which basically says, we stand and criticize people. For the most part, the thing they built is worth more than our criticism of it. And one of the things that we should be doing as critics is giving a chance to the new. Um, InfoSec people are super, super quick to tear down the new. And it's interesting because what we've been doing historically hasn't got us to a very nice place. I don't know that the new is not junk, but our old stuff was almost certainly junk. Um, we should be more embracing of the new. Um, the modern CISO is in a powerful position. And because every talk needs an Uncle Ben quote, um, w with great power should come great responsibility. Um, for those of you who are in the position to buy equipment, to buy security tools, we need to start pushing back on bad vendors strongly. Part of the problem right now is we've got a really broken ecosystem. Um, if you take AV vendors, I'll pick on who are easy to pick on here. Um, we know they're doing something fundamentally wrong. Nobody pushes back, so they're not forced to change. You've seen vendors who are doing horribly, horribly fuddy marketing. If we don't push back on it because we know better, essentially you leave that fud in the marketplace and the smaller companies swallow it up. Um, you need to almost take it as a responsibility to fix that stuff, to push back on that stuff, so we can start clearing up the ecosystem. Um, if you were a security researcher, um, a little while back, Jacob Torrey wrote this post um, on uh, playing the wrong game. And essentially, he spoke about how security researchers are wanting to do cool zero-day research, and actually people are getting bitten by phishing attacks. And the cool research is awesome and still needs to be done. But at some point, that line is going to become too far. Um, the, the work we're doing has so little implication for the man on the street that we're almost not doing any good at all. Um, and it's something that we need to fix. Um, recently, I was on a Slack, and, and I said something about uh, Apple's security team being awesome. And, and a whole bunch of people replied with the version of Apple, lol. Now, now, I'm not sure how many of you know people on the Apple security team, but they've got some of the brightest minds in the world there. Um, Ivan Kristic has done ridiculously cool stuff. Um, Windows Snyder was there. At the moment, David Litchfield is there. There's a whole bunch of really, really clever people. Um, and the same thing happens when I talk about Slack security team. Someone will respond with Slack, lol. And, and on the one hand, um, most of it is dismissive, but it's also ridiculously wrong-minded. Like, I question the people who said that about Slack, 
And what they were talking about is that on their crypto coin Slack, people are able to come on and attack other users or something stupid like that. The Slack security team is one of the best in the game right now. If you follow them on Medium, some of the posts that they put out are ridiculously cool. Um, Ryan Huber's got a post where he talks about what they've built for their logging. But essentially, it means that every syscall on every Slack server runs into a database so that if any server does something that it didn't historically do, it flags an alert to the security team. How many of us have that running on our networks? Um, sounds simple enough. We, we just haven't. And for researchers, it's interesting because when we win, we win with little things. We own someone, you get your lol, you get your shout, you get your, um, you get your moments of fame. And again, I say this purely personally because I spent a really long time, like I spent 12 years doing this, breaking stuff, giving talks on breaking stuff, uh, writing papers on breaking stuff. And in the end, what you figure out is for the most part, you drawing in the margins of other people's work. Um, you're doing useful stuff, it's necessary, but you never get to create your own masterpiece. Um, and this is my personal, uh, like I say, my own personal thing and, and a drive that I want to share with you guys. And, and as a quick example, I went back and looked at some point. Um, in 2004, we did this talk on uh, network strike back. So, when you're running a network, how to build things that attack your attackers. It was cool, we did the talk a bunch of places around the world, we got a book out of it, um, people thought we were clever. Um, in Feb 2004, Mark Zuckerberg built Facebook. Okay, so while me and a whole bunch of my friends were saying things like PHP lol, Zuckerberg built a multi-billion dollar company um, on PHP. Um, in 2009, um, we gave a talk called Clobbering the Cloud. 2009 is when Uber was born. Um, in 2007, we did a talk on timing attacks. I love that talk of ours. It's one of the nicest uh, pieces of research we did. And that year, um, Apple built and released the iPhone. I'm not sure if any of you have ever read uh, The One Device. It's a book on the formation of, of how the iPhone was made. But it's incredible. Like, like if you read the founding story of the iPhone and how many things had to click, like literally if I had to change my career now and if, if there's anything I wish that I was a part of, it would have been awesome to be part of that team. Like literally to me right now, those guys changed the world. There's the world pre the iPhone and the world post the iPhone. And for the most part during that time, while I thought I was doing cool stuff, um, I was writing in the margins. Um, so uh, again, my, my big pitch here for you guys, for all of us, is to make more stuff. Um, there's a quote from Why the Lucky Stuff, which basically says, when you don't create things, you become defined by your tastes rather than your ability. Your tastes only narrow and exclude people, so create stuff. Um, you see this all the time. You sit on channels where people are Android people or iPhone people or OS 10 people or Linux people or Windows people. Like, what is that? Go, go make stuff. Um, Ida Glass has this really cool quote, which I'll skip um, because I'm late, which talks about how hard it is uh, to build stuff initially. Because when you build stuff initially, for a while it sucks. And only after you get past this hump, it starts to get better. And so he encourages people to push past that hump. And, and I want to give an example here. Um, my company sells, builds and sells a thing called Canary. We put out a free thing called Canary Tokens, which is a way to get honey tokens for yourself. The first version of Canary Tokens that we put out, um, while most of our other stuff is not written by me, which is why it's uh, more solid, the first version of Canary Tokens was written by me in badly written Go. And the first version was written in a weekend. It was pretty ghetto. This is not me being fake humble. Like, it was lame. I spent hours just getting jQuery right, and it kind of sucked a little bit. Um, today, 
Canary tokens has been downloaded, the Docker images have been downloaded literally more than 10,000 times. So, so there's Canary token servers running everywhere. Um, ridiculously smart people like Colin Molina have given talks on using Canary tokens for other stuff. And all of that magic happens just because you create something. Um, Canary tokens are functionally so simple. It's you connect to me, I create a random string, I keep that random string next to your name and I give you the string. Anyone could do it in four hours. You could do it in 10 minutes. But because we did it, we got guys like Colin Mullen are hanging out with us um, when we go to Black Hat. Um, all you gotta do is take those steps, create the stuff, um, and good things will happen. Um, I'll zoom through this. For all the doom and gloom, I think InfoSec has hope. Mostly, I think it has hope because of these young new companies. Um, if you look, um, so the examples I've got up there, Coinbase, Uber, Airbnb, Slack, you start to see a different type of security company. These are not security teams that are standing there and telling you what you can't do. These are security teams building solutions that actually work. The example that I often quote here, um, that's a guy called Four from Uber, and Four was working at Facebook when he did this, but he basically helped create their two-factor authentication system called TwoFac, and took it to the point where it's faster to two-factor authenticate at Facebook than it is to not two-factor authenticate. So people are not choosing 2FA because it's more secure, they're choosing it because it's faster. Um, and if you watch that talk, you'll see a really interesting thing, where he keeps building and then goes, we can do better. He builds a part and then goes, this still sucks, we can do better. In the end, their solution ends up with patches to SSH, but it works and they're getting what they need. And, and the important thing for us to look at from a Dunning-Kruger perspective is we look at that and think, oh, but that's because they Facebook. But not really. It's because F4 didn't stop and say, people must 2FA because I'm security and I said so. It's because he kept going, we can make this better, and then did. Um, I'll skip that. Um, so again, it's all ridiculously open. It's all ridiculously hopeful right now. Um, for those of you who've been doing security for more than 15 years, there was a time when we thought nothing would replace Apache. Like if you wanted to protect Apache, the best you could do was add like mod security or something like that. And then you see Nginx come in and completely upend it. Um, for those of us who thought we'd never get past OpenSSL, um, Jason Donenfeld came through and wrote WireGuard in 4,000 lines of code. And it promises to be an auditable, secure, fast uh, open VPN alternative. There's literally a whole bunch of cool things to be done. Um, there's so many important problems to solve. Um, don't waste your time being the other guy. Don't waste your time um, just uh, poking fun at other people. Um, We'll leave with Feynman because it'll give the impression that the talk was actually better than it is. Um, mainly, don't fool yourself. Um, there's hard work to be done. You need to show up and do it. Um, I think we've got like a minute. Um, that's all that I've got. Um, if you've got any questions, you can shout them now or tweet and tell me why I'm an idiot. Um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>